Um, good morning. My name is Tom Gilbert and water resources specialist with the Maine Forest Service. Uh, let me see here. I got a little transcript going on. Um, so welcome to uh, the Maine Forest Service Chapter 25 training, otherwise known as the chop and drop training. Um, this is a part one of a two part training. Um, I think most of you have signed up for a field site. Uh, we have two field sites available right now, one in Lyman, uh, which is tomorrow, and then one in Wesley on the 14th. Uh, we have postponed the Bingham training. Um, we will get in touch with those who have signed up for that one. And I think we're looking for mid-July uh, to do that one. Um, if you want to switch your training, please get a hold of me and we can, uh, we can do that. Um, so licensed foresters and fisheries biologists who complete the training uh, will be uh, eligible for those um, benefits of the chapter 25 process. Um, basically, it's a streamlined process for uh, the, this, uh, the practice of adding large wood for fisheries enhancement. And uh, we will maintain a list of, uh, of those licensed foresters and fisheries biologists that have completed the training. Um, we have a pretty good lineup for you this morning. Uh, Mary Gallagher with IFNW, John Field with Field Geology Services. Uh, we have uh, Jim Fronte of the Maine Forest Service and Chris Reedy of NRCS. Um, so without further ado, I think we're going to start things off with Mary. Uh, so Mary, if you want to take it away. All right, bear with me as I try to share my screen. And let me know if you can see my um, my first slide. Looks good. OK, great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining today. Um, this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And actually, as I'm scrolling through the names of attendees today, I know quite a few of you. So welcome to uh, today's session. And let's get some more wood edition going in some of our streams if we can. Um, so what I'm going to talk with you first up is the whys. Why are we interested in doing this type of work for fishery management reasons and fishery conservation reasons? Um, well, it's an interesting story, so let's get started. I'm going to talk mostly about the biological effects of wood addition. And if I can get to my next slide. And really, my focus on this is, is, of course, our iconic trout and salmon populations here in Maine. It's something that we are very proud of, and we would like to continue the history of um, robust, healthy, wild trout and salmon populations pretty much statewide. And habitat quality is a big part of this. So, but just to reacquaint ourselves with the basic life history of wild brook trout, because um, this is a species that I think we all are quite familiar with, but um, like most of our, uh, actually all of our native salmonids in the state of Maine, they spawn in the fall um, in loose gravels, and, and that's a term to kind of keep stuck in your head a little bit, because this is an important habitat type for, for salmon as well, but certainly for our brook trout. The eggs hatch late winter, early spring, sack fry swim up, into the water column in early spring, usually around the time of ice out and as temperatures are starting to increase a little bit. Young fish uh, live their most of their life in kind of faster flowing ripples, and there are some differences across their life history strategies for brook trout because they are kind of habitat diverse. But when we're talking about stream dwelling populations, our young fish, juveniles, tend to spend most of their time living and foraging in our riffle habitats um, that is ripe and, and, and prolific with a lot of in-stream cover, overhanging vegetation, undercut banks, those types of features around boulders, um, things like that, that provide some level of protection for these guys as they're small and growing. And then it's our adults um, that really depend on higher levels of cover element, especially with good quality pool habitat, pool, pools being features in a riverine environment that are a little deeper um, than the, the typical or most of the stream channel. Um, 
And if anybody is a brook trout angler, in, in, uh, in especially targeting stream-dwelling fish, you kind of know this. You know where to drop your fly or, or your, your uh, hook for whatever reason. You're, you're going to target these areas that have cover in a little bit of deeper water. because That's where your kind of targeted fish are. Um, but what is the problem? Well, we know that wood loading in Maine is lower than expected. And I'm gonna show you some information that got us there. But, um, and the reasons for this is, you know, really our riparian stands in close proximity to most of our high quality and occupied wild brook trout habitats, the riparian stands tend to be too young for natural wood recruitment. And because of a legacy of log driving that includes bulldozing, channelizing, and changing stream features in a variety of ways to facilitate log movement in the past, we have these lasting effects on, on stream processes and ecology. And this is why we're talking about wood addition here today. But what got us here? Well, one of the beauties of working for IFNW for as long as I now have is we actually do have a treasure trove of survey information on habitat quality for a lot of rivers and streams in our state. Our staff over the years have done systematic habitat condition surveys in, in all sorts of rivers and streams, focusing largely on what are known to be good wild brook trout areas. But one of the things that we have come to realize and found across the board in pretty much all rivers and streams that we have surveyed is kind of this consistent chronic condition that we see in our streams. We have low numbers of pools overall. This is a constant finding that we see when you start comparing survey data across rivers and streams for various parts of the state. There are large distances between these pools. And just in general, we have large overall uh, or low overall percentage of pool habitat statewide. Now, why is this a concern for wild brook trout? because pool habitats are a vital habitat type for mostly the larger bodied, older adult fish. And these are the ones that are most important for maintaining our robust populations in the state, as well as these are the ones that are targeted by anglers. So of course we have an interest in trying to make life a little easier for our older and larger size classes of brook trout. So why streams? Because of course we have iconic lake and pond dwelling trout too. Well, um, streams are really kind of the bread and butter habitat type for wild trout, especially in the smaller and younger age classes. These tend to be the areas where the bulk of our uh, juvenile production occurs. And as fish grow, they do sometimes end up in larger lakes and ponds on the landscape. But streams are an integral habitat type for more than just wild brook trout. These are the linkage habitats that kind of connect the movement of certainly animals and creatures, but as well as physical features and, and energy inputs and processes from our uh, forest land, wetlands, through lakes and ultimately the ocean. These are corridor habitats that are highly occupied and sought after by a variety of creatures on the landscape from, a, from big vertebrates all the way down to the tiniest uh, macroinvertebrates and, and uh, small, small sized creatures. Water is life. It's not a, not a, not a joke to think of it that way. Um, and these uh, streams become our main corridors for the movement of, of creatures and materials from high elevations to low elevations and across habitat types for across the board all kinds of materials and, and living beings out there. Um, now it might have been a while since you've thought about things like the iconic aquatic food web way back in probably high school biology you remember maybe vaguely that kind of the primary energy input for most food webs on the surface of this planet that we are aware of, you know, by the way, is all driven by the sun. And of course that is true for, for most or, or many of our aquatic habitats, but when you're talking about 
shaded areas, forested streams, it's a different story. And that is why we're here today to talk a little bit more about forested streams, headwater streams, and why wood addition is important. Um, because in these types of streams, headwater streams and these forested shaded habitat types, it's not the sun that drives the whole process and energy input overall. It's what ends up in the stream from the local landscape in the form of coarse per, or organic matter, wood, leaf litter, uh, other larger components of, for, of the forest uh, 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 forest adjoining the, the stream system that end up in the stream and start this whole process overall. And you can think of a stream aquatic food web as having kind of four major components or layers, however you want to think about it. But of course you have your, your base energy input, whether it's coming from the sun or from organic matter. Plants can be an important part in areas that are driven by sunlight. But in these shaded areas, you know, the, what, what starts and begins the decomposition and the processing of the, those larger sized organic inputs in wood and leaf litter and stuff like that really is at the micro scale, uh, driven by microorganisms, bacterial action, fungal inputs, you name it, it's across a whole slew of creatures and, and processes involved with a continual breakdown of that material. But the additional and kind of another large component of our aquatic food web with that we're highly interested in and takes quite advantage of these uh, organic matter inputs into our streams are the macroinvertebrate community that are there. And these can be further broken down into four major components where there's a variety of terms out there, but for the most part, things can be classified or grouped as shredders, collectors, scrapers, and predators. And these target and process food in different ways. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And, but the other kind of thing to remind ourselves about all of these macroinvertebrate groups that are in this uh, particular layer of the aquatic, stream aquatic food web, they're all food for our targets in, 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 uh, in this discussion at least, which is our fishes, our vertebrate predators as well as other vertebrates out there. So why are these macroinvertebrates important in stream systems? Well, these are the, the, en the engine, so to speak, of breaking down all of that kind of coarse organic matter in the form of leaf litter and sticks and wood and, and all that good stuff that falls heavily in our fall season for the most part. Um, the shredders are a big part of this process where they take this leaf litter and literally crunch it down and process it into just physically smaller pieces through crunching action, ripping, tearing, eating, consuming, you name it. There's a variety of ways that they can do it. And for in the realm of uh, macroinvertebrates, these are creatures often in the categories of uh, caddisflies. Uh, mayflies are important in this, and some of the larger stoneflies for sure. And in those areas of our riverine system where we have sunlight, such as you know in this top picture here, where sunlight is you know kind of driving that traditional aquatic food web system, and you do get some bacterial or algal growth, biofilm growth on some of the features within the water, within the, the stream system, you get a group of micro, macro invertebrates that kind of are often referred to as scrapers or grazers because these guys are scraping those biofilms and algae off the surface of the rocks and the sediments. And again, taking that larger energy input from the sun in this particular case and breaking it down into physically sized smaller components for continual processing by additional components of our food web. So and another kind of broad group of macro inverts are these collectors. Um, one for now, as long as you guys can hear me. I don't see it. Um, the collectors tend to grab 
food particulate materials right out of the water column um, in a variety of ways. And you probably have seen these guys in our stream systems um, doing a variety of, of mechanisms. But another thing to remind ourselves about how particulates move in a flowing water system is it's not in a straight line. It's not always predictable. Particulates tend to kind of meander and swirl in conjunction with the water, as well as just flowing around rocks and other in-stream features. So you see these guys doing a variety of tactics to grab those particulates out of the water column. And up in the upper uh, left-hand uh, uh, picture of this particular slide, we see these little guys that have kind of a stalk with fronds sticking off of it. And these are adhered to a substrate feature usually. And, and uh, these fronds are, are the little features like kind of like antennae, so to speak, that are pulling particulates out of the water column. Does anybody have an idea what those kind of, what these creatures really are? Feel free to pipe up. You know what these are up in the upper left-hand photo of this slide? Nobody black knows. Flies. They are black fly larvae. And, you know, everybody has complaints about our black flies. But you know what? They are a hugely important food resource for a lot of stream dwelling organisms. So we'll just leave it at that because I'm actually a fan of black flies. Um, and another common strategy for uh, the, our collectors for, for collecting and grabbing food particulates out of the water column are a group of caddis flies that build these nets and, and they're literally like little fight nets within the water or, or that they build on the surface of, of rocks and other substrate features within the stream. And particulates get trapped in these nets that they build and spin. And the caddis fly itself will actually be living way at the bottom or the tail end of this net and just grab the particulates as they fall in. And of course, there are predators. These are the ones that you guys are probably, or everybody is most familiar with because they tend to be larger in body size, easier to see for, for most people. Um, and they are, do come in a diversity of forms and types, but the most common ones that we see in our streams um, and, and aquatic habitats, of course, are the dragonflies and damselfly larvae. Um, megalopterans that can be big, big honking things and uh, these are a tasty food bite for, for fish predators when they encounter them. And of course, some of our stoneflies can be predatory too. And, and you know, pred predation in an aquatic food web is just kind of a function of body size. Everybody eats somebody else once you attain um, this, this particular trophic level. And of course, our fish and other vertebrates fall into this category as well. Now, the one thing to keep in mind about stream systems as we're talking about these diversity of macroinvertebrate types and, and how creatures that inhabit these systems find their food and what food resources they actually key in on um, is the sources of organic matter are different depending where in a stream system you are. Um, you know, when we're talking about our headwater streams, you, you may have heard the term alochthonous. Um, uh, food inputs or energy inputs coming from the landscape surrounding the stream. This is our traditional headwater stream system where uh, the, the primary energy food input into the system driving that food web from the beginning is coming from the landscape nearby. So it's the leaf litter, it's the leaves falling in at fall time, the sticks, it's wood, it's whatever finding its way across the landscape and ultimately landing in the stream channel. Those areas of a stream system that tend to be um, traditionally sunlight driven, where that ener initial energy input is being generated from within the stream, i.e. through plant or algal activity, it is often referred to as autochthonous um, um, energy inputs. Now, Streams vary across the landscape in the relative proportion of both of these processes. In a true headwater system at the tippy top of a drainage where water is first percolating across the landscape and forming into streams in the first place, it's very uh, highly alochthonous driven. Whereas in, in other stream types where that are, tend to be lower down in the system, or after a cutting scenario, if somebody has come along and cleared even the riparian areas, 
suddenly things can change to an autochthonous system. And it's not the same and consistent across the board. It depends on the local conditions at the stream site, as well as the position you are at within your watershed. Streams and rivers within the watershed perspective can be broken down into three broad kind of locational categories. Of course, we have our headwater systems that are highly driven by um, leaf litter and, and wood and energy inputs tend to have much higher slopes, faster flows. Um, uh, the bed material grain size can be large because anything small gets rapidly transported downstream. Whereas in the middle portion of your drainage, you tend to have what's called the transitional or transfer zone where uh, things are transitioning from typically high elevation, high slope areas to lower, ele slightly lower elevation, lower slope areas. And, and you see reflective changes in the size of the stream itself, as well as the sediment size that is indicative of that position of the watershed. Um, well down into what's called the deposition zone, the base of a riverine system where it ultimately will connect with either a larger river or the ocean where things are much lower slope, tend to be much lower in elevation, wider, much more water and material being transported. Although material is, is uh, being, because flows are lower and you're dealing with generally a wider, uh, larger overall system, um, the larger sized uh, and, and sm smaller sized materials tend to drop out of, say, being transported and end up in being de deposited in a variety of ways and places in the system. But because of these changes in overall condition across your riverine system, we also see dramatic changes in our macro invertebrate communities that reflect these changes in habitat type and flow regime from when you first look at these things in a headwater system all the way down to the to bottom or the river mouth system. So wood becomes less influential in streams as, these, uh, as the progression of a river flows downstream and widens out, overall flow becomes a little lower or less uh, um, variable that kind of thing. And, and wood is just kind of a, becomes less of an important habitat feature, although it's still significant in producing some level of energy input into the system overall. It is important to, to remember that, but its overall influence becomes reduced. So that's kind of the, uh, why wood is important from an organic uh, um, energy input perspective. But wood is also a physical feature within our stream systems that is a major contributor to overall physical habitat types. Um, in our especially within small and medium-sized streams. So our headwater areas from first, second order, maybe even third order streams. These tend to be in, or at least in high gradient parts of our drainage. Um, the function of wood uh, is primarily to help retain that coarse particulate matter in pockets and collection areas higher up in the drainage. And again, this is important for our macroinvertebrate community up there to, that is usually predominated by shredders because it gives them time to process that larger sized material into the smaller particulates and parts. That, that, that it then becomes more available to some of the other components of the food web. Uh, wood in these higher gradient systems is also influential in altering flow and producing variable flow regimes. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's very important for sediment trapping, um, for producing areas of, of collection of small um, uh, rock and sediment types that become additional habitat features in some of these higher gradient parts of our system. Now in a lower gradient part of the drainage, 
Um, wood is highly influential as a cover element, which is again, very important for brook trout as well as other fishes that live in these areas. Still continues to alter flow regime in these areas. And again, and that's an important feature for stream dwelling fishes. And here it becomes very influential in helping us produce more pool habitats as well. Another key feature that we're interested in. So one thing about stream dwelling fishes is you know, these guys evolved in conjunction with the variability that is inherent with a stream and system in, in general. You know, their streams, uh, especially in the higher reaches, the higher parts of a drainage are highly variable across space and time as far as flows, depths, features within them, sediment sizes. Um, you know, it's, it's, kind of more of a chaotic type of environment than something that is much more predictable. And stream dwelling fishes that live in these habitats have evolved to take advantage of these situations. But the important key of that is to provide them the, the microhabitat, the diversity and conditions that they need in order to survive in variable conditions like that. So one of the things we're highly interested in and Wood Edition helps us tremendously is providing um, increasing depth and velocity variability across the board um, in these stream habitats where you get wood features that are scouring action deeper areas, but also provide protection at high flow events for a fish to maybe get out of the extreme flow during, say, a big rain or storm event. So variation is key. Wood in, in these systems also is highly helpful in providing sediment sorting for us. You'll see sediment of varying sizes being dropped out of solution, so to speak, as flows come down in conjunction with a wood feature within the stream channel. Here's a perfect example in this photo where we're seeing a variety of sediment sizes at different parts of the channel in conjunction with the wood that is there. And just another bonus, for us in the world of managing fisheries, um, especially for brook trout and salmon that need a variety of these substrate features, as well as our macroinvertebrates that are living down in these gravels and in uh, cobbles, um, uh, you know, to, to, for, for life and survival and, and finding the food that they're seeking out. Another important feature with uh, adding wood in some of these more variable conditions is uh, wood features within a, a stream channel has the ability to help attenuate flashy flows for us. And one of the things that just, uh, we're not trying to dampen and remove all flashiness or, or variability in flow regime, because again, stream dwelling fishes kind of rely on and certainly have adapted to a lifestyle that allows them to survive in, in variable flow conditions. but one of the things that we are um, very cognizant of, especially in this era of changing climate and, and you, uh, you, you get into flow regime changes due to some, th some of the activities on our local landscapes, where you're just trying to dampen the level of flashiness. Nobody likes to see a dry stream bed in the late summer, as seems like drought conditions are becoming more prevalent in recent years, at least. Um, when we can store some of that water for a longer period of time in relation to some flow events, it becomes, you know, life in during uh, changing conditions may become a little easier for some of our stream dwelling fishes. Okay, um, and one of the important features to kind of keep in mind as we're talking about how to add and implement additional wood inputs into our streams and rivers is wood certainly has the, the ability to influence overall carrying capacity for trout and salmon that occur in these areas. Um, there, of course, there are a variety of things within a, a fishery community that certainly has the potential to affect overall carrying capacity. But there are three major features that wood can directly influence. Certainly habitat complexity, adding uh, large wood to, to riverine channels right off the bat adds complexity to the overall habitat type that is there. 
it certainly has the ability to affect overall hydrology of the system by contributing to and enhancing in some respects the, the flow variability across the stream channel and across time um, for stream dwelling fishes. And this is likely mostly pronounced in summer seasons where one of the factors that we're um, seeking and trying to do is to get more pool habitat, more deeper water habitats available within the system. So fish have a place to go if flows are, are lower than normal or we're in drought conditions. Um, and wood certainly can affect your overall invertebrate production within your channel. And again, this is fish food. This is one of the reasons why we are adding wood to streams and encouraging landowners and stewards to do more of this is it's, it helps and starts and enhances that overall food production system as well as influencing the physical habitat features um, for fish. So, how influential is it? And are our changes actually noticeable? Well, the short answer is yes. And I'm going to show you some data collected from Maine as well as elsewhere to show that adding wood to some of these streams actually translates to either more fish in the area or sometimes fatter, bigger fish. And of course, everything takes time. So it's not like you're going to add wood and then immediately see a a whole, you know, huge increase in your fish population, but it certainly will change. Um, our Department of Marine Resources has been experimenting with wood addition in streams for quite some time now in their salmon rivers, mostly in the down east area. But in Old Stream in down east area, this is some older data from DMR from quite a few years ago. But when just an observation and surveying where salmon uh, juveniles tend to be when you're looking at sections of this of old stream that had low wood loading versus high lo wood loading. There's just more young of the year and par occupying in both. Uh, I mean, in uh, the high wood loading areas versus the low wooding, well, low wood loading areas. Um, there's a variety of reasons that this relationship is, is occurring, but for the case with Atlantic salmon, one thing to remind ourselves with is they tend to be a little bit aggressive towards Yukon specifics. And one of the angles of adding wood addition that alludes to increasing uh, carrying capacity for salmon, at least, is you know just adding wood to a system and adding more cover elements allows an individual fish to maybe not see its its neighbor as closely or as close, you know, as near to itself. So it tends to allow uh, a little tighter crowding within an area, so to speak, i.e. an increase in overall carrying capacity. Um, and I will just say this, that brook trout just don't tend to be as aggressive towards their conspecifics as, as we often see in some of our salmon areas. Just kind of keep that in mind. Um, but for large wood and Atlantic salmon, again, this is another kind of data set, another study from DMR from a few years ago. But when you look at an individual stream and you look at one year or in a, um, some uh, sections of the stream, Again, across two life stages for the species, young of the year and par across different years, uh, when we physically added wood to particular streams, um, there was always a higher density of both year classes in both years um, in the sections where wood was added versus the sections that wood was not. Um, and this is a pattern that we see across the board in a variety of systems. Here's Mule Brook up in northern Maine, up in Aroostook County, um, large wood and a brook trout habitat. This is a, a, a project I've been involved with for many years. Um, Mule Brook, although it should be a high quality wild trout stream, um, it tends to, to get a little too warm in the summer months for to hold trout year round in the main stem at least. They have to go someplace else that might be a little cooler, at least in most years. Um, but we, we're curious to see just what brook trout would do if we added wood to a couple of sections in this, in this particular stream. So one of the things I did um, is we have three monitoring sections up in this system. There's a, a upper section 
that's listed in blue, shown in blue, the middle section of the river, and then a lower section is in green. And just started electrofishing these three areas of this system every year, most years. Um, and then we added wood to the middle section only after 2010. It was late 2010, early fall of 2010, I believe. And just continue to electrofish and see what happened with our brook trout population in this stream. And right off the bat, our brook trout start, and this is electrofishing that is occurring in late July or early August every year. So it tends to be a stressful time or getting into that stressful time for brook trout, especially in a stream that is known to have thermal issues. Um, but what we began to see is, is larger sized brook trout holding in the main stem channel through that stressful time, at least more so in the middle section where wood was added. And there are some anomalies across the data set. 2015, we happened to be up there electrofishing right after a large angling party had been in there fishing that stream really hard. And it was a really hot summer, if I remember right, too. And in 2016, we had very high flows and our electrofishing efficiency was just terrible. And we just didn't catch any fish at all. Um, so, you know, there are anomalies. Streams are variable. But the general trend is we're holding larger sized brook trout in that mid channel with wood addition that was not likely to happen very often before. Okay, and the last stream I'm gonna talk about for Maine is Intervale Brook. This is one that's up in kind of the Roach River system up in the Moosehead, greater Moosehead area. It's a very high gradient um, uh, system had a long history of log driving and changes to the stream channel to facilitate log driving. And um, even had a, a fully intact, non-passable log driving dam up near the headwater part of the stream. Um, and it's about four miles long in total before it, it's confluence with First Roach Lake. Um, but great brook trout habitat. One of the beauties about this stream is it does not have temperature issues. It's always nice and cold uh, and has continues to, you know, and has always been known as kind of a, a robust wild brook trout stream. However, when we started looking at this stream for potential habitat manipulations and doing some electrofishing in three sec or four sections, I'm sorry, four sections in this particular stream starting in 2012. And the plan at the time was to add wood at some point and as well as some other habitat uh, altering uh, actions to facilitate um, improving the habitat condition for trout. Um, we you know, started electrofishing these sections and we always had very high numbers of brook trout up in the uppermost reach, which was the least affected and still was pretty high quality trout habitat overall, but was above that fully blocked fish passage barrier. We did remove that barrier, by the way, as part of this project. But then we also did two miles of wood addition or roughly two miles of wood addition in various, in the midsection of the river. And we did this in a variety of ways um, because it is a kind of a larger system, higher gradient, gradient than what is typical for a, a straight chop and drop type project. Although we didn't actually cable logs or woods into certain areas, things were kind of heavily anchored naturally as best we could. And some huge trees were pulled down, left with uh, riverbank connections to hold, uh, help maintain their stability at the location for a longer period of time. Uh, some berms that were obviously the, the product of past bulldozing and, and stream bank hardening for facil facilitating log driving and that kind of stuff. Some of those were, were cracked open and getting some more side channels and slowing flows down a little bit. We did a variety of strategic things in kind of this uh, middle section of this river. And then the last thing we did was almost two miles of straight chop and drop wood addition um, in that mid section.
actually a little wider and a little bigger and dealing with a little more water. But one of the interesting things about intervening We remove the dam and fish could not only be produced up there and grow up there, but could also now return to that area after moving downstream and feeding and foraging for a bit. Um, this is a very interesting stream and I'm planning to go back later this summer and replicate our electrofishing again and see how we're doing. But this has been an incredibly exciting um, project and the what the habitat manipulations in the wood addition that we did there, um, I think is some of the best improvements we've seen in Maine so far for a classic wild brook trout stream. It's not just us here in Maine that are doing this kind of thing. Um, our colleagues over in Vermont have been dabbling with this for maybe even longer than we have. And recently, uh, my colleague Judd Kratzer with Vermont Fish and Wildlife um, published. Excuse me, but Mary keeps cutting in and out for me. I don't know if that's happening for anybody else, but I'm missing a lot of what you're saying. Yeah, it's happening for me as well. I'm sorry. Yeah, I missed I missed a lot of the last slide and then this one as well. Nobody can hear me. We can I hear you now. Hear you it now, is Mary. a bit spotty. Um, Hello? Hello? Can you hear I me? Hear you. Yep. Now, we can, now okay. we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, but this is a, a slide from Vermont. And um, biome, as soon as the wood was added into this, these particular sections of, of the Nulhegan in, in the Northeast Kingdom, biome overall, uh, brook trout numbers as well as biomass dramatically increased uh, with the continuation of their annual monitoring. This is a pattern we see when in when this type of action is conducted in mostly brook trout habitats as well as other salmonid habitats for sure. When the stream is a good candidate for wood addition, um, and we'll, and that's another topic for actually the field day is when is a stream a good candidate. So hold that thought so you're in the field. But we have done a fair number of these types of projects now in Maine in various areas, focusing in kind of our forest areas for sure. And uh, here's just some examples of, of large wood additions that we've conducted in Maine. Um, John Field, who's going to talk in a little bit more about the physical processes involved, is I think these might have been all of his projects actually. Um, but we've also done quite a few now through a variety of programs and a major partner on this action now in our state is the NRCS. So we've done a fair amount. Um, we'd like to see more. Not every location is a candidate for this action. And that's one of the kind of things we're gonna focus on with uh, additional modules of today's program, as well as when we're in the field talking about how to actually conduct the project. So with that, that, uh, does anybody have any questions? That's like wood addition for fisheries uh, 101. Mary, I missed uh, some of what you said on the two slides ago where you were talking about um, in addition to the wood, uh, go back, yes, that one. You had wood added plus a number of other <clears throat> um, improvements that you made. Can you quickly run through those again? Yes, this was what I refer to more as a comprehensive habitat improvement project where wood addition was one of the primary components, but it wasn't the only thing that we did. We removed the dam that was up at the 
near the headwaters of this system that was the remains of an old log driving built structure. Um, and it was a complete barrier to fish passage at the time. And it was, that was removed. The other things that we did in various sections of the river that is within the upper and within the lower, kind of that middle two mile stretch of this river, um, we removed some of the berm features so that the stream, the stream was really, had been bulldozed and highly channelized to facilitate log driving. So we, we cracked into that berm um, in many strategic areas to just kind of facilitate and release the energy at high flow events. So the stream could reintroduce side channels, lower flow channels. Um, reconnections with the floodplain, try to get floodplain connections reestablished. And the other thing we did that is not necessarily within the realm of straight chop and drop as we're talking about today, but large trees in close proximity to the stream banks in the riparian area were physically pulled in with heavy machinery and major root wad connections were left on the bank. So those large trees would hopefully stick around for a longer period of time than if they're uh, you know, strategically felled in most cases. Um, this is a very high energy steep river. So that's one of, we had to kind of do things to hopefully, ho oh, and we took and a lot of the big boulders that had been physically removed from the stream to um, facilitate log driving in the past were re uh, rolled back in and put back into the channel to also help anchor some of those large wood as well as help provide flow um, refuge areas at high events for fish. That's what we did. Um, That's great, it's thank a very, you. Yeah, it's a very interesting project. I think it is one of our better performing ones in the state. Any, anything else? Thanks, Mary. Uh, there'll certainly be time for more questions if, if anyone uh, uh, thinks of one later on. Um, so um, up next is John Field uh, from Field Geology Services. Talk about some fluvial geomorphology. So I'll hand it over to you, John. Good morning. I trust you can see my screen at this point. Yeah, I see it. Very good. Well, Mary did a good job of covering the sort of biological and ecological uh, benefits of chop and drop. I'd like to extend that a little bit and speak to how uh, chop and drop wood additions can also uh, benefit the fluvial geomorphology or physical stability of the stream, not only at the site where you're uh, adding wood, but also throughout the uh, stream system. Uh, in the long history of New England, we've had log drives, the construction of a transportation network, a period of land clearance and now reforestation, uh, and throughout all this time, uh, fighting uh, large floods that are impacting our uh, settlements. And as a result of all these activities, we have dredged our rivers. We have straightened our stream channels. We have burned our river channels to keep them out of the floodplain. Mary just talked about that on Intervale Brook. We've armored our riverbanks. We've bridged our channels. We've dammed the streams. 
and we've simplified the streams by moving the wood and boulders out of the channel or off to the sides as here on the Saco River in Conway, New Hampshire. As a result of all these activities, we've discovered that the flooding's gotten worse. The erosion more severe. The damage is more costly. And the habitat degraded for brook trout and other species. So how can we address these issues? Sort of in the last 20 plus years, stream restoration has come to the fore as a way of sort of addressing these problems that have resulted from past land use. But can we really call it stream restoration if we try to stabilize a bank by planting trees in the riprap? in the hopes the trees will grow to maturity and provide some of the shading that Mary has described as being critical. But can we call it stream restoration if it looks like this three months later? Meandering streams provide great habitat with the close proximity of pools and riffles. But can we really call this stream restoration if three months later the stream channel has straightened itself out again? So what, what went wrong with these projects, well-intended projects, but didn't succeed? Well, I would argue that wood is absent from these projects. Wood can be useful in addressing these problems, but I want to add a huge caveat that if you place this wood poorly in the wrong places and in certain instances or locations, if you don't anchor it properly, a uh, wood can become a hazard. So it's a delicate trick here. We want to use wood to reduce these problems, these flooding hazards, these erosion problems, but we need to do it in such a way that it doesn't become a hazard in and of itself. So I'll stress that a little bit as we go along, uh, but I want to mention that out front too. We need to be careful in what we're doing if we're using wood on streams to address these problems. To try and understand, um, but uh, before I get ahead of myself, uh, but we can use wood and have been using wood placed in streams to address these problems. We've also turned to the science of fluvial geomorphology to uh, restoration efforts are not working in some and why we are left with a legacy of flooding and erosion after a couple of centuries of, of land use in New England. Let me give you an example from the Upper Amanusik River in Stark, New Hampshire. Uh, they have a stretch of road right along the, the river. Uh, that was uh, eroding. Their efforts to stabilize it have failed, so they've tried again. And if you look in the river at all the boulders, uh, you can see that they've been trying this uh, stabilization for decades. If we take a step back and look at the location, we can see it is at the confluence of Millbrook, a tributary to the Upper Amanusik. Millbrook is dropping a lot of sediment into the uh, upper Amanusik and forcing the river up against this bank. So if we want a sort of sustainable solution to the upper Amanusik problem, maybe we should be looking up at Millbrook in the upper watershed, trying to understand 
how one area of the stream is potentially influencing another. And I might also add, we might want to consider what we're doing at this site and what influence our stabilization efforts might have further downstream. But let me speak uh, more about a, a broader issue uh, throughout New England, throughout the country, throughout the world, I might add, and that is of channelization or channel straightening. I cannot overestimate or overemphasize to what degree the stream channels and river channels of New England have been straightened whether it be for hydropower like here on the Kennebec River. But if you look at topographic maps, the evidence for channel straightening in New England is unmistakable. Let me point out from uh, the White River in Vermont here, let me point out three hallmarks of channel straightening that are easy to spot on topographic maps. Here you'll see a sort of natural meander dimension here, what we might expect to form naturally. And we'll also see an area downstream where two or three of these meanders might fit, but they're not there. So missing meanders, uh, you might say, is your first piece of evidence that the channel has been straightened. Number two, please note how the river channel is plastered against the mountain side. The close contour lines indicating the steep mountain side here. And so the river channel has the entire sort of floodplain to migrate across, but there is no river channel there. It is suspiciously plastered against the mountain side. That's your second piece of evidence that river channels have been straightened. And the third piece of evidence is sometimes you can see the missing meanders. This small tributary is actually occupying and helping to display on the topo map the original meanders of the river here that were abandoned as a result of the straightening. So this piece of the White River shows all three hallmarks of straightening, but really you only need to see one to convince yourself that the rivers have been straightened. When I started out with this consulting business of mine uh, about 20 years ago, I spent a lot of time convincing people that the rivers were straightened. At this point, it, the, the evidence is so widespread and so obvious that you need to convince me now that the river has not been straightened. That's how ubiquitous straightening is throughout New England. What have been the impacts of that channel straightening? Let me uh, just compare uh, one cross section and a straightened section to river channel with another cross section just downstream in a meandering section of river channel on the Connecticut River in sort of northern Vermont, northern New Hampshire area. In black is the artificially straightened section, cross section one as I showed you previously, cross section two is the meandering channel. What you'll see, even though these channels are within a mile of each other, or these cross sections are within a mile of each other, we can see that the straightened channel is much wider and from top of bank it is much deeper. Another important thing is you will see that it is extremely flat all the way across, if you will, whereas in the meandering section we have this sandbar. Now think about the low flow scenario in the summertime when water temperatures can get hot. In the straightened channel, that water is going to spread out over a much wider area. The flow is going to be shallower and slower and more prone to warming. 
Whereas in the meandering section, this sandbar is basically confining the low flow to a much smaller area, meaning that water that the water is deeper, moving faster, and less prone to warming. From a habitat perspective, this is a wasteland on Indian Stream in northern New Hampshire. This is very wide, very shallow, warming in the summertime, and as Mary also pointed out, very few pools. The reason uh, Mary's studies and the IFNW studies are showing so few pools in these streams is because they have largely been straightened. Now, the, the impacts of channelization are not only uh, a biological impact, uh, and they're also not only an impact within the straightened area, but the impacts flow downstream as well as uh, migrating upstream. Let's focus on the downstream aspect. A straightened river, you can see, is shorter, steeper, higher velocities, more capable of transporting sediment. Another aspect of the straightened rivers is that they create what I call fast changes. You can see the old meandering section on Bear River and New Remain here. The old meandering section just sort of glanced along the high bank at my number one. But after the river was straightened, you'll see that we have created a sharp bend at number one. And at this sharp bend where excess energy is being expended because it's a fast change or a fast turn along the river, uh, we see erosion. This erosion is generating even more sediment. Number one, the straightened river is more has greater capacity to transport sediment, but then it's ending at a hard bend, which is generating even more sediment. That sediment is now moving downstream. In this case, it has clogged a previously straightened section of river channel and has started to form a new meander, which was creating an eroding riverbank here. So as a result of this erosion here, we created more erosion downstream. We have since stabilized this uh, riverbank here uh, quite successfully over the 10 years since we've done it. Uh, but I argued that we, can't, we not only need to stabilize this riverbank, but we also need to stabilize this higher eroding bank, which we also did and also succeeded. So uh, we need to understand how one site is impacting the other and uh, addressing the sort of the source of the problem, not only the symptom of the problem, if you will. So the point being these straightened river channels are more efficiently transporting sediment. Notice no sediment bars, no sorting of sediment, no uh, pebble-sized uh, substrate for spawning, uh, and, and not to mention extremely shallow and wide and few pools. But I'm emphasizing here the sediment is just moving through these systems and then being deposited somewhere else where it can be a hazard, such as on Cold River in uh, New Hampshire, or it can create these very wide, vegeta unvegetated uh, gravel bars, very little shading, but also pushing against the opposite riverbank where if you're doing a bank stabilization project, it's not likely to succeed. You need to understand where you're doing this work and understand what the problems might be. 
So where does wood fit into this picture? If we look at what wood is doing naturally, then we can get a sense of what wood might do as part of a restoration project. What we've noticed uh, over the 20 years of work in New England is that log jams forming in a straightened river channel will divert water out onto the floodplain and carve a new flood and carve a new meander in a matter of hours. Depending where you are, this can, can be a positive thing or it can be a hazardous thing. Here on the Batten Kill in Arlington, Vermont, uh, this homeowner might think it's a bit of a hazard thing because they went to bed one night, the stream channel was 300 feet from their home, and they wake up the next morning and the river is now lapping up against their front lawn because a log jam has blocked the river and reformed a meander. Straightened river, straightened river channels are inherently unstable and prone to reforming meanders. If you have a lot of infrastructure nearby, that's a potential hazard. If there is no infrastructure nearby, then it's a potential restoration opportunity. I just want to stress that this reformation of meanders can basically create a natural looking meandering river, which was once straightened. How can I be so certain that the Pulteney River here on the border of Vermont and New York was previously straightened? Anyone want to take a guess how I know this was straightened in the past, even though it's fully meandering now? It looks like it's really jammed up against that eastern side, whereas it sh you should have been meandering out in the flats more, I would guess. Exactly. We've got plenty of floodplain here for the river to meander across. It's awfully suspicious that it's plastered against the hillside here. And that's my reason for thinking that this once was completely straightened along here, but is now fully re-meandered with sort of its natural form. That, that's occurring over, well, it, it depends. Some, some of the straightened rivers from the 1800s remain perfectly straight, have been unchanged, whereas other straightened rivers sort of fully recreated their meanders in, in a matter of years or decades. Um, I, if someone wants to ask later, I can get into why that might be, why some areas uh, uh, respond differently, but let's move on here for now. So rather than sort of excavating meanders with no structure in them, only to see them straighten themselves out in a uh, few months time, uh, what if we add the structure? What if we add the log jams? What if we construct a log jam and try and divert water to reform a meander? So rather than create the meander, add the necessary structure in the stream channel so the stream can naturally reform its meanders. If we add key pieces of wood to the system, we can hope natural wood can jam up and create a log jam rather than constructing the log jam. We can provide the materials for log jams to form naturally and allow the river to sort of reoccupy some former meanders. You can also see we can trap a lot of sediment upstream of these log jams. This is sediment in what was a straightened river channel where that sediment used to uh, move downstream onto these wide unvegetated bars and up against pushing up against that bank stabilization project 
which uh, unraveled in just a few months. So by putting wood in straightened river channels, we can sort of trap sediment and alleviate problems downstream. I want to stress that river channels were straightened throughout a watershed. The smallest streams in the uplands and the forested areas, all the way down to our valley bottom, large streams as large as the Connecticut River, doesn't get any larger in New England. All streams were straightened in the past. So when we start shifting our thoughts now to chop and drop projects. There is a role for chop and drop in the upper watersheds where stream channels were also straightened. Such as here in the Bear River watershed, again in Newry, Maine. Uh, we did a series of chop and drop projects in this area. Here's the before photo. Here's an after photo basically just felling trees on the stream side and dropping them into the river channel. Nothing could be simpler, although you do need to be a trained sawyer and you do know need to know what you're doing. Number one, to be safe, and number two, to drop that wood in the stream channel precisely where you'd like it to fall. When these chop and drop projects first started, people were a little timid. Let's just put in a couple small trees and see what happens. After seeing the success of some of the early chop and drop projects, later projects are putting lots and lots of wood in these stream channels because we like what we're seeing. What is it that we're seeing? Well, first of all, when the big flood comes and all of that wood that's been dropped in the stream channel starts moving around, when we go back after the flood, we can see log steps have formed, oxygenating water, slowing the water down, reducing velocities so it's less energy and less flow moving downstream. We see log jams creating great cover. We can sort of place our wood precisely in some cases so that we can make sure some of these features form. This log you'll see is felled so it's up against this standing tree, helping to lock it in place. We can space our wood to create steps uh, in a more natural. Excuse me. Uh, we can sort of number one, you'll see again that we've sort of uh, dropped this log so it's behind this rock to help anchor it in place. Also dropped in between these standing trees to help anchor it in place. But you also see we're dropping wood with a spacing of about three to five times the channel width in this case. This is naturally what you see on mountain streams is a spacing of steps like that. So you want to sort of target your key pieces of a chop and drop project to try and mimic that kind of spacing. In some cases, those key pieces will accumulate a lot of additional material. Sometimes you can chunk up your wood that you've dropped to have some mobile pieces to get clogged up against the major pieces. Uh, this is going to send water out onto the floodplain. This is going to reduce the flow velocities moving downstream, reduce the amount of discharge moving downstream all at once. Reactivating the floodplains in the upper watershed is going to reduce flooding plain or reduce flood problems downstream. Now, you as a single practitioner of chop and drop 
is not going to be able to solve the watershed's problems, so to speak. It's going to take miles and miles and miles of upper watershed treatment, or I would argue upper watershed management that allows wood to accumulate naturally um, to sort of before we start seeing real improvements downstream, we need to treat lots of the upper watershed. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't start. That doesn't mean one individual uh, isn't having some minimal impact. Uh, we want to move the system in the right direction. So don't think because I can only do a mile, it's not going to do much. Don't think not to do it. You should do it anyway. There are those nearby habitat benefits that are accrued immediately. And even though it might take uh, decades to start seeing a combined benefit downstream, we do see the sort of aquatic benefits immediately. Some of those aquatic benefits is all of the organic matter that's being captured uh, behind here. This is uh, food as Mary talked about for the macroinvertebrates, and uh, then they become food further up the food chain. You'll also see sediment accumulating here. Uh, you see that better uh, here behind this step here, sediment accumulating, but behind this larger dam, you can really get the, the feeling for how much sediment we are trapping as a result of these chop and drop projects. Uh, these are mountain projects where you see this. We've done a couple in sort of lowland areas of southern Maine. I'm interested to see uh, tomorrow on the site visit how much sediment has been accumulated there. Uh, that the what we'll visit tomorrow was about 10 years ago. Uh, so I expect we might see some sediment accumulation. I did visit another one in Biddeford last week uh, that we won't visit uh, that after three years really hasn't uh, accumulated any sediment. So it really depends on the watershed you're in, how rapidly the project will respond. But in this case, in just a year, we've accumulated all of this sediment uh, as a result of this chop and drop project. Uh, and this is uh, number one, potentially good spawning sediment for brook trout, but number two, this is sediment not moving downstream, not feeding those large oversized gravel bars that are sort of degrading habitat and causing uh, erosion problems. Here's a chop and drop project uh, that was done in the 1990s in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. Uh, they were sort of the spearheaders of this chop and drop technique, as far as I understand, uh, in New England at least. Uh, and this is a much older project. The river channel used to extend from here all the way behind Scott Wixom here, you'll see this red flag. This was the edge of the river channel prior to chop and drop. So all of this wood addition has accumulated so much sediment that we've basically created a new floodplain. We've narrowed the channel back down to its sort of prehistoric levels or pre-alteration levels. Uh, and so this is sort of providing the floodplain for water to spread out, slow down, decrease uh, flood peaks downstream. So, uh, so this is fast forwarding the chop and drop project. You can see what your project might look like 20 years from now. We also did some monitoring of the chop and drop. Uh, project in the Sunday River area uh, years ago. Uh, Mary showed uh, a little bit of the results of that, but I'll show a little bit more. Uh, one thing is uh, the sediment storage. Here's the control reach, very little change. The, um, this is showing grain size. Uh, 
our grain size is changing. Uh, the two treatment sites, uh, the after treatment results showed a great deal of fining of sediment that's indicating the fine sediment is being trapped in the upper watershed. This is the sediment that will find it easiest to otherwise make its way downstream to those valley bottom settings where we have lots of infrastructure and erosion hazard problems. So again, if we can trap and hold the sediment upstream, we are potentially positively impacting downstream, not only creating habitat within the site, but having a positive impact elsewhere as well. Hey, John, uh, uh, yes. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. There's a couple of gray boxes uh, at the bottom of your screen that's obstructing your graphs a little bit. I don't know if you have windows, other windows open on your computer or if there's any way to get rid of those. Just wanted to, to let you know that. They're, they're small gray boxes. They're, they're not hiding a lot, but. Oh, hey. uh, I'm in full screen mode and I'm not seeing that, so. Okay, yeah, they're, they're not a huge sure that is. Yeah, I hope it's not impacting too much. Um, anyway, there was some suggestive information uh, from our monitoring of these sites. Uh, we have downstream of treatment and upstream of treatment in blue. This is water stage information, not discharge data. So I want to be clear that this is only suggestive. It's not really well documented, but we can see that the water stages were lower downstream compared to upstream of the treatment site. So uh, the suggestion is, is that the chop and drop project is helping hold water, decreasing this sort of water stage downstream at some of these during some of these storm events that were recorded. You'll also see that the water stage remains high after a storm event, so base flow seems to have been increased by the chop and drop project uh, downstream. So these are sort of positive benefits, both hydraulically less of a flood peak downstream, but also ecologically higher water in the sort of low flow periods. Oops. And, and again, that's sediment that's not feeding these large oversized bars downstream, which is sort of the primary culprit of all of our erosion problems. Uh, all of our road washouts, all of our bridges getting washed out, culverts getting plugged, et cetera, is because of all of this excess sediment coming from the smaller tributaries upstream. So chop and drop, even though you need lots and lots of it, every little bit of it helps. It's sort of moving us in the right direction to sort of undoing the problems created by channel straightening uh, decades, even centuries ago. So sort of the practicalities, if you will, of chop and drop projects or unanchored un large wood additions is sort of a more technical, but not as fun way of calling chop and drop projects. Um, but just some general rules, if you're thinking of running out there with your chainsaw tomorrow, just a couple things to keep in mind before you do so. Um, we can add wood on larger streams. That needs to be anchored wood where you're near infrastructure. So your unanchored chop and drop projects are best in the sort of heavily forested first and second order smaller streams and where you can drop trees that are uh, longer than the channel width. You want this tree to drop into the river channel but also span to the other side so it can get anchored behind boulders or in between standing trees to help hold it in place. 
uh, thinking about the spacing of pools and steps on um, on sort of your smaller mountain streams, um, the, that those pools and steps tend to be spaced every three to five times the channel width on these smaller streams, steeper streams. And so you can try and mimic that by sort of dropping your largest trees uh, with that kind of spacing in mind. Uh, then you can have smaller trees in between that you expect to move and clog up against the larger trees to create log jams and steps, et cetera. Um, also, to help anchor them in place, you might want to place these large trees upstream of standing trees and large boulders. I, I do want to point out that we did a project on Nass Stream in New Hampshire similar to chop and drop, but we placed wood at bridges where we could easily get into. We placed whole trees at bridges. Uh, this is a larger stream, and over a period of years, that some of that wood that we tracked, some of that wood moved several miles. So I just want to be clear that you need to be thinking of smaller order streams, your larger uh, streams, third and fourth order, the wood is going to move. Nass Stream is nine, nine miles of state forest. We had the freedom to let the wood move downstream. There was no infrastructure, so that was a unique opportunity, uh, and, it, and it was useful at this location. Most cases, you're not going to have that freedom. But I show the slide just to emphasize this wood can and will move great distances on larger uh, stream channels. And so you want to stay away from it if you have infrastructure concerns. We have talked a bit about using smaller pieces, either smaller trees or to sort of uh, chunk up your larger trees in smaller pieces. So you have some wood that's moving, but that's going to be trapped by these larger uh, sort of anchored pieces. Uh, where you are near infrastructure, where you do have a bridge downstream, you want to avoid confined channels because if there's no floodplain, if you do get a log jam formed and you get lots of wood moving and accumulating to a very high level, then if there's no floodplain for the water to escape to, that water can build up in the river channel higher and higher and higher and potentially could burst your sort of log jam and send a wave of water like a dam break flood uh, downstream. So again, if you have miles and miles of wilderness, maybe that's not a concern. But if you do have infrastructure downstream, you do want to avoid that potentiality by working only where you have a floodplain. Even where floodplains are present, you might consider building a log strainer or a trap just upstream of the culvert. Uh, this would involve sort of felling two trees on either side of the riverbank across the river channel, sort of cabling those tops together. We're not cabling in these chop and drop projects, but where you have infrastructure concerns, uh, you might want to chain or otherwise anchor uh, these trees together. Now we have uh, something that will hold if we get lots and lots of wood accumulated in here. A log jam in the woods is fine. We just don't want it to break and cause uh, a problem where we have infrastructure downstream. Notice we have a floodplain here. So the wood's going to jam up in the channel, but now the water can escape around the log jam like here, the water can get out and spread out onto the floodplain so we don't have more and more and more and more water building up in the channel. So it's not going to be as much of a hazard uh, and no problem with water leaking out on the floodplain here 
that's ecologically, uh, one would argue, a, a, a good thing. Um, so talking about the floodplain, uh, when you're cutting the trees, you want to be thinking about improving the forest and health. I'm sure many of you know much more about that than I do, what trees to cut so that the forest stand becomes uh, healthier over time. So think not only about the stream channel, but the floodplain forest. Uh, also, you want to think about leaving older trees on the stream bank that are going to fall naturally on their own. There'll be sort of future recruitment in the near term. Uh, and don't cut that. You say, oh, that's an old and dying tree. Let's just cut that one. Actually, maybe that's one to leave because it's going to fall in soon anyway. Uh, and then placing some wood on the floodplain to prevent scour. If water is spilling out on the floodplain, if there's any depressions, uh, swales where the water is going to concentrate, you might end up carving a new channel out there on the floodplain. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but that's perhaps not something you necessarily want, or maybe you do, you have to think about that. But if you don't want the stream channel moving around, you might fell some trees out on the floodplain to break up the water so it won't concentrate and uh, begin to carve a new channel. Not a great risk here, very thick forest, but in other places that might be more of a concern. So there's some general tips uh, to improve uh, your chop and drop projects. Uh, and again, Mary did a great job of explaining the ecological benefits of chop and drop. And I hope I've shown that chop and drop can also have a sort of uh, geomorphic benefit, improving stream stability, stream function, not only at the site of the work, but also downstream. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, any uh, quick questions for John now? Again, there's, there'll be more time later on um, when we're finished here. If there are no questions right now, um, I think now is a, a time for our break. Uh, we're running a little ahead of schedule or behind schedule, um, so maybe we'll do a five minute break. Uh, so if we want to return here about 1038, uh, that'd be great. And then I can uh, get going on explaining the chapter 25 rules. All right, hopefully everyone has returned. Um, can anyone see my presentation OK? The main forest service chapter 25 rule. Yep, can yep. see it fine, Tom. Looks Great. good. All right, so I'm going to give you a rundown of what this uh, what's in this rule. Um, so this was developed to uh, basically um, standardize this practice and um, give licensed foresters a means of uh, becoming project managers. Of, of this practice. It's uh, always um, a, an opportune um, moment during a, a timber harvest to do this. You have all the equipment on site and the means to, to do this practice. Um, so uh, we hope to encourage uh, more of this going on around the state. And you can find uh, this rule in its entirety on our website, mainforestservice.gov in the water resources section. I will say that these rules are undergoing um, some amendments right now, and we hope to see those amendments complete and in effect uh, in the summer of next year. Uh, so be on the lookout um, for those new rules. All right. Here we go. All right. Uh, so the chapter 25 rule, um, as I said, is it's a way to standardize uh, this practice of placing wood into streams. Um, and it it's somewhat of a streamlined process um, for for this practice. Um, it's a, an alternative to the, your traditional um, uh, Natural Resources Protection Act permit that you would need to get. Um, so anything uh, going in on or over a, a water resource typically would need that NRPA permit. Uh, under this process, you would not need that permit. 
and uh, the project would not need to be um, submitted or overseen by a state uh, fisheries biologist. Uh, they would have to be involved in the process, but a, a licensed forester under this process is able to be the project manager. And this was established in 2012 to facilitate chop and drop projects or harvest sites. As I said, this, this is a good opportunity uh, to do this. Um, so as I said, uh, licensed foresters can oversee these projects without that NRPA permit. Uh, as long as um, they're trained in this in this process. Um, so this is that training, um, uh, this online portion in addition to the field portion, and we will maintain a list of, of those licensed foresters and fisheries biologists that have completed the training. And uh, as I said, the licensed forester must work with a fisheries biologist, either from IFNW or DMR, uh, one that has attended this training. And in the early stages of these projects, um, a fisheries biologist will uh, look at a proposed project site and potentially designate that uh, reach, that stream reach, as appropriate for this uh, practice. And um, they would work with the licensed forester to, to develop a treatment plan. And of course, this uh, the, the 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 plan would have to be consistent with Chapter 25 um, standards, wood loading standards, uh, et cetera, which I will talk about in a little bit. So that treatment plan I mentioned uh, is uh, it's a pretty uh, basic, um, pretty basic plan. It's one page with uh, mostly just uh, basic info, stream name, town, GPS coordinates, uh, bank full width, total number of pieces of wood and a signature uh, from your fisheries biologist and licensed forester. And you would submit that plan with a forest operations notification. Uh, otherwise known as a FON. Um, so that FON would have to be submitted uh, regardless if this is uh, a real uh, bona fide uh, timber harvest or not. Um, so that's our, our, your means of notifying the main forest service that uh, this, this treatment is taking place. And uh, along with that FON, you would submit that, uh, that treatment plan. On the FON, you'll find a box that you can check to indicate that this is a uh, chop and drop project and you would include a map uh, showing the location of the treatment area. Uh, again, that treatment plan would have to be signed uh, by a fisheries biologist, and if this project is taking place within a Atlantic salmon area, it would have to be a DMR uh, fisheries biologist. So an overview of the plan uh, of the process uh, in all, um, you're attending the training, and again, we, we maintain a list of those foresters and biologists that have attended the training, and um, you are considered trained uh, in this practice for five years. Um, the fisheries biologist would designate uh, that project area, uh, that stream reach that, that you're proposing to do your project at, and that designation is valid for four years. Uh, you prepare that treatment plan, and um, you would notify the main forest service that the treatment is taking place uh, through submitting that FON in addition to that treatment plan. So getting into those chapter 25 standards themselves, um, these standards were taken from um, Project Shared, a, a nonprofit organization in the down east area, as well as the US Forest Service in um, the state of Oregon. Uh, the North uh, Western United States have been kind of early adopters of, of this practice. And so we've looked to see how they had done it uh, to um, design our own standards. And so our standards establishes uh, maximum loading rates, the maximum number of wood pieces, um, minimum size of key pieces. Uh, John had mentioned um, that mentioned that keyword a few times. Key pieces are those pieces of wood that um, make up the bones of your structure and, and hold it in place. Um, the standards provide guidance on orientation and, and placement of your wood, and addresses uh, sedimentation, shoreline zoning downstream infrastructure, a lot of the details uh, to consider. Few limitations uh, when you um, do a project uh, using the chapter 25 standards. Uh, only wood can be placed below this, the bankful elevation of the stream. Um, so for example, if you thought uh, putting a boulder cluster in the stream channel uh, would be a really good idea that that uh, that wouldn't be able to qualify for the chapter 25 standards. You'd have to get an NRPA permit for, for something like that. 
It relies on the size and orientation of the wood for stability. So the, uh, the weight of the wood is, is what's holding it in place in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so anchoring your wood um, to the shoreline or, or um, against one another uh, is another thing that would not be allowed under the Chapter 25 standards. Sedimentation must be minimized. Um, that pretty much goes without saying with any uh, project next to a water body. Um, but in this case, oftentimes uh, a root wad is is a is a great feature for to to have in stream. But under the Chapter 25 standards, um, it's a it's a little limiting. That root wad often can holds a lot of sediment, um, so we um, we prohibit that unless you uh, somehow remove that sediment from a root wad. Uh, we we wouldn't be able to to use that method. So wood placement standards for key pieces here. Um, so the, again, those key pieces are, are what makes up uh, the bones of that structure to, to hold it in place. Um, they would need to be two times the bankful width if there is no root wad attached or 1.5 if there is a root wad attached. Um, that root, root wad being outside of the water body, of course, on land um, as, a, as a weight to hold it in place. And two key pieces required per structure. And we have minimum diameter of those key pieces and that diameter uh, increases with um, the bankful width of the stream channel. Um, as John mentioned, uh, these projects are really only going to be taking place within first and second order streams. Um, so we're probably not going to go much further beyond um, 20, feet, 20 feet in bankful width. Um, so one example here of, of some amendments are going to be made um, to these standards. And I'll just mention here, that um, there are times where the NRCS standards are acceptable um, and Chris Reedy will talk a bit about their funding opportunities. Um, and um, so when a NRCS is, is funding a project, uh, you, you would have to go by their standards and that's that's acceptable um, if if you're doing a chop and job project that is funded by NRCS. Um, we accept the NRCS standards in those instances. Loading rate for the Chapter 25 standards, we have maximum pieces uh, per mile and um, minimum diameter of trees, 40 to 60% must be greater than 12 inches in diameter, the remainder being uh, 6 to 12 inches in diameter. That's another piece that's going to be amended in the, the new rules, uh, which we hope to see next summer. <clears throat> so standards for wood placement and orientation uh, also included in, those, in the Chapter 25 rules. Um, here's an example of some schematics we have, um, some relatively simple schematics, but they, they I think they get the point across. Um, and and uh, letter A there, you see a couple of trees are laid along uh, the river bank there to kind of narrow that channel and concentrate that water flow into the center of the stream channel. And a large piece of wood is placed over those trees to, to stabilize them, but also to direct the flow either over or under the wood. and 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 B, you see how uh, the results of that, the the intended result of that uh, to create a, a nice pool on the, on the other end of that log. Examples here of, of how to direct that flow to create a, a pool. Um, you see in A, there's a log uh, that's placed um, partly uh, within that, that bankful flow, uh, forcing the, the, the flow to move under that log and scour away the sediment below it, uh, creating those pools. In B, you see a log that's placed directly in the bankful flow. Um, that's going to cause the flow to um, disperse and go off to either side. Um, not necessarily going to create that the, the the pool if that's what your goal is. Um, if your goal is to perhaps direct the, the flow into a floodplain uh, to get the benefits of that, um, possibly that would be a good idea. Otherwise, um, not what you're looking for if you're trying to create uh, some nice uh, cold water pools. And then C is an example of a, a log placed um, just above the, the low water summer um, wetted width there, um, forcing the, the higher flows to go over that log and, and creating that the, the, the scour feature you want. So we have a number of suggested configurations uh, for wood placement as well. Um, a bunch of uh, patterns here, some simple patterns, X's and A's and, 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 and so on. These can be combined to create more complex structures uh, for stability and, and for additional habitat features. Um, 
you can in include uh, some branches uh, of trees, some trees that include branches to to create greater um, cover for juvenile fish, and they also help to recruit more debris. Downstream infrastructure is a concern, of course. Uh, you know, we don't want to cause any damage to existing infrastructure. Um, so we require that there's at least two meander bends uh, present between the end of the treatment area and any downstream road crossing. And it describes other considerations. Um, the, the trees that you're using for these projects, of course, count towards um, the, uh, the maximum removals within shoreline areas. They're, they're of course, um, shoreland standards for timber harvesting in shoreline areas. Those, uh, of course, do apply in these projects. And um, Jim will talk a, a bit more about that uh, once I'm done. And sedimentation, again, of course, always a concern. Uh, like to take reasonable measures to, to minimize that as much as possible and to, to see some remedial measures if any excessive sedimentation does occur. So a few examples here of some projects that we've that we've done, we've assisted with over the years. Uh, here's Cooks Brook and Lyman. This is the one we're going to look at tomorrow. This is pretty early on in uh, in that treatment, and so it's been a few years. I think about ten years since this is done. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what this looks like now. Uh, but you can see uh, that log uh, right up in front there. It's put um, just below that the uh, the bank pool flow there creating that that water, making that water go over and creating that um, that pool on just the other side there. You can kind of see where that pool has has deepened on the other side of that log and that, that the sediment has been has been scoured out and moved just beyond it. Some sediment trapping here. We've heard a lot about that, um, creating some some good habitat for spawning and and creating that sediment sorting that's that's so important in our, our stream channels. Here's Ashworth Brook. Um, this one was done um, just last year. I think it was last uh, spring or summer. This was done. I had a look at this um, earlier uh, this spring, and it's looking great. Um, some some really good features starting to form there. See some sediment soaring on one end of the tree. On, on the river right section, on the river left, we're seeing um, uh, the, the water fall, creating a little step there. To, to, hopefully, over time, it can create a nice uh, cold water pool. And you can notice how that the tree on, on, on river right is, is wedged in between a couple of standing trees to, to hold it in place. Some more in Ashworth, Ashworth Brook here, a couple of trees placed in an, an X pattern to, to stabilize one another. And an additional tree with a lot of limbs intact was kind of wedged in there uh, to uh, recruit more um, debris and um, some additional cover for juvenile fish. Another example here of um, some some uh, intact limbs placed uh, around a key piece uh, at Ashworth Brook. Here's a picture of Mule Brook. Um, is the tree where a rude wad was was left attached, and it's you can see it's there on the on the land and holding it in place pretty well. And another example of a a, a tree being with with limbs being added to to the the structure. Um, for more habitat value. So that's all I had for you on those standards. Um, I'm willing to take a few questions now. Um, and again, if if you think of something later, we'll have time um, later on in the presentation. OK, great. Um, I think up next we have um, Jim Ferrante who will talk a bit about some um, practices of forestry and some of the, the legal um, considerations. So whenever you're ready to present, Jim. I think I saw Jim here. If not, I can uh, cover his Yes, I'm here. How's everybody doing today? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry. Good to see you. <laughs> little technical difficulties. So I'll just, yeah, I just, hi, I'm, I'm Jim Ferrante with the Maine Forest Service. I'm a district forester out of the Greenville office. 
yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, other other forestry laws that that may apply to when you're doing doing drop and drop projects and you know some other just general management things to be aware of when you're out there making decisions about uh, you know which trees are actually going to end up in in the water and which ones aren't. So yeah, um, so some of the some of the biggest rules, especially in our uh, our organized areas, organized towns. Are, is going to be uh, chapter 21. So those are your statewide standards for for timber harvesting within a shoreland zone. Um, and like I said, this applies to towns that have adopted our statewide main main forest service standards for uh, shoreland zoning. Um, there are towns that have their own shoreland zoning. Um, one of the one of the great things about towns that are statewide standards is uh, the forest service has has maps of all all of those towns on our website. So it makes it very easy to, um, at least for planning purposes, know where where. Um, first of all, how um, if if it is a zone wetland and uh, how much of a buffer is required, I can uh, I'll get into the exact details of um, how the buffers break down. But um, then we also have our our municipal towns that do, have not adopted uh, statewide standards. That's that's a little bit more challenging for folks uh, doing projects in those towns because you're you have to contact the town's code enforcement officer. Um, they're they're the ones that are you know responsible for the shoreland ordinances. Um, hey Jim, the, we see the the title screen right now. I don't know if you're advancing or not, but hmm. yeah, maybe one of the um, one of the arrows down arrows or left or right arrows to advance. I'm advancing it. I'm not sure okay. why you're not seeing it. All right, maybe uh, it looks like I might be able to advance it for you. Can everyone see that second slide? No. It looks like you may have the option underneath his first slide that you can go ahead and link, uh, make him go forward yourself. I just sent. Uh, Migrated to slide two. So I, I yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I can, I can change it on my screen, and I can see it. I'm not sure why nobody else can. I, I also can um, change it. I'm on. I just switched to two of fourteen. Um, if everybody can do that, maybe Jim, you can tell us as you're advancing to different slides, and we can do it ourselves. Yeah, if that if that works for everybody, I'm like I said, I have no trouble advancing it forward or backwards, so I'm not sure why nobody else can can see it now. So currently, I'm I'm at I'm at the bottom of slide two right now. Sounds good. Yep, we can we can see it. We can advance it on ourselves. Just let us know. Sure, certainly. So as I was saying, um, DEP can provide some guidance in terms of uh, what you're responsible for in, in non statewide standards towns. But um, so everybody can switch to slide three now. So he, here's a good illustration of um, you know where in where in the watershed you are and, and uh, what what um buffer area you're responsible for. So this is important too when you're filing the fawn uh, to know um, you know make a decision on on what uh, shade retention plan you're going to have. So. Uh, in the fawn, you can you can either uh, you have three options. You can either uh, remove 40% of the volume within the shoreland zone. Um, you can retain 60 square feet of an air, of a uh, basal area, or you can um, have have a uh, outcome based um, option, which is a combination of the first two that requires uh, you submitting a, a plan to the Forest Service for review. So as you can see, high up in the watershed. Um, you know, you you basically just have to maintain shoreland integrity. Um, that's that's the biggest thing. So no like operating machines in and out of the bank without protecting the banks and the and the, uh, the 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 body water itself. And then once you get down below that um, into the 300 acre uh, drainage, you you still have those three options for shade. But then your buffer jumps up to uh, 75 feet from the high water mark on either side of the channel. And then once you drop down below 25 square miles, um, your your buffer jumps all the way up to 250 square uh, 250 feet from the high water mark. 
All right, so I'm going to move on to slide four now. Is everybody able to do that? Yeah, it works out for me. OK, great. So um, Tom already kind of talked a little bit about NERPA or Chapter 1000. Um, so one of the biggest things that, you know, where NERPA applies when it comes to chop and drop is um, there's, you know, no sedimentation in water bodies. So, you know, if, if you're pushing whole trees over into a stream to create, you know, habitat, you have to be very careful to stabilize any soil that you're disturbing on or near that bank because just because you're you're following the chapter 25 standards you, you're still held accountable for you know these nerpa standards and then when you're in um unorganized territory it's important to understand um you know which subject uh sub districts you're operating in um depending on where you are on the landscape you there may be um additional permits you need to um to get through the forest service And the next I'm going to move to the next slide here in a minute, but we're going to talk a little bit more about more about, I guess you call them management practices when you're actually making decisions on what what trees you're going to put into the stream. So the four S's, so species, size, straightness and soundness. Um, you know, I think most of most of the folks, you know, at least that are foresters involved in this process are not going to be taking their high quality growing stock or saw logs and laying them in the stream. But it is important to realize that, you know, certain trees have uh, more value for, for different uh, uses than others. So um, in terms of like financial value, certain certain species are much more financially va valuable than others. So if you look here, you know, on in terms of softwood, you know, your pine and spruce are going to be, um, you know, your high value softwoods and then grading through all the way down into hemlock, which is one of your lower, lower paying uh, softwood species. Same goes for hardwood. You know, it's, most hardwood species have a relatively uh, high saw log value, so it becomes more of a, a form issue when it comes to hardwood. But yeah, your sugar maple, your yellow birch, oak and ash, you know, those those are those are really valuable. So and then, you know, there's certain species from an ecological standpoint, you know, standing, you know, something like yellow birch or white oak. The value they they provide to terrestrial uh, wildlife, I think, is is noteworthy. Uh, just talking about that as well. Um, so if everybody could uh, move to slide uh, six now, please. So this is just talking about the uh, forms of different trees. Um, you know, you know, a nice straight tree, you're probably going to want to continue to grow that for a, a forest product where trees with obvious defects like crooks and sweeps and forks, you know, they're obviously going to represent a much lower uh, financial value. So utilizing them for a chop and drop project, um, not only are you, you know, you, you know, adding wood to the stream, you're um, reducing competition from those other quality trees you want to growing. So you're actually, you're actually doing two different things at once. And you know, everybody has limited time. So if you can if you can get more bang for your buck in, in these projects, I, I that's what I recommend. Um, and then obviously like um, things like um, like rot and, and, and hollows and things like that are, uh, are are obviously not great for timber value. That being said, um, I also like to, to leave, you know, snag trees standing in the forest. So, you know, picking trees with sort of you know, more like crooks and forks and things like that, I think I think are are the best uh, candidates for chop and drop trees. So um, everybody want to move to slide number seven, please. So it's also important to note that, you know, different species of trees have more decay resistance than others. Um, it's important to note too that, you know, when when wood stays wet or especially if it's submerged it it dramatically uh increases the time it takes for it to break down so in that you know i, I'm, I assume most people are aware that you know like especially like white cedar has a very high rot resistant uh res rot resistant wood whereas with something like balsam fir um rots rots very quickly same same goes for uh hardwoods you know your your uh your oaks are a uh, pretty rugged tree. They they resist decay for a long time, whereas your your birches and aspen rot away in a matter of you know a year, a couple of years or two. You know there's pretty much 
hard hard to, to tell that it was even a tree aside from the paper birch bark that's left over. Okay, so if everybody wants to switch switch to slide number eight, um, like I already alluded to before, you know, recognizing um, snag trees that are existing in your riparian zone, I think are are important to retain those as as standing components of the stand. Um, you know, they're already they're already providing a lot of uh, valuable habitat for wildlife, um, whether it's you know um, foraging or 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 um, nesting habitat, it's it's really important to maintain those. Well, slide number eight, you know, down wood, especially hollow logs, you know, that's stuff you want to leave where it is. Um, you know, pick those those sound, poorly formed trees along the bank to utilize and let let this this let this sort of stuff, you know, continue to do it, its own thing because it this is an incredibly valuable um component to our forest. And you know, as this as this material breaks down in, in the uh, shoreland zone, you know, these nutrients are are leaching into the water body. So it is it is a net benefit to the whole system. So the next couple slides I'm going to talk about, um, you know, the, diff, the the three main harvesting systems we uh, we utilize here in the state and New England in general. Um, they all have sort of their their um, strengths and weaknesses in terms of um, how they can be utilized in chop and drop. So everybody uh, go to slide 10 now, please. So the you know your classic uh, hand crew system. So you know um, a, a, a guy running a chainsaw with a cable skitter. You know they have you know 75 to 100 or sometimes more of, of cable on the winch. They're able to um, you know cut trees at a, a relatively relatively distant area from from the machine and, and winch it up to the machine. Um, they have some they have some um, benefits to chop and drop. Um, you can maneuver trees relatively easy, um, especially the right size trees with with a cable skitter. And then with with the with the use of the winch, you can adjust exactly. You know, you want to obviously follow the tree as close to where you want it to be as possible, but you have the option of using the winch to adjust that exact location. Um, the the one of the biggest drawbacks to it is um you know you typically want to winch trees by the butt end. So um, you, you need that to be relatively, you know, close to shore when, you, when you're doing that. OK, so uh, slide number 11. So um, so this would be like a, a cut to length system where, um, you know, you're using a, a, a tract or, or wheeled feller buncher and a, a, a grapple skitter to move the entire tree out of the woods. So it's a whole tree system. So you no know, trees cut at the stump and everything you know, the top, the crown, the branches, everything comes out to a landing is processed. So um, one of the one of the biggest advantages to a to a cut to length system is is the feller buncher. It's a very large, powerful machine um, that has a pretty significant reach on it. Um, it's also extremely powerful, so you have the option to, you know, push the average tree over pretty easily. Um, what once again, keep in mind that you want to keep keep any um, you know, expose soil out, out of your water body. So keep that in mind. And you know, one of the one of the you know the, the one of the drawbacks of it being a big, powerful machine is it's a a big, heavy machine. You know, this feller buncher in the picture probably weighs seventy thousand pounds. So, you know, this a, a good portion of planning goes into you know knowing the timing of when you can work in these sensitive areas. OK, everybody can go to slide number 12, which is our our cut to length systems. These are becoming increasingly more more and more common in the state. I'd say they're probably the predominant system at this time. Um, it's a two two machine system. So you have the the processor, the machine that cuts and and, and processes the, the wood in the woods into its. Uh, its uh, product lengths. And then you have a forwarder, which is essentially, you know, like an off-road log truck that picks up the, the finished products in the woods and brings them out to the roadside. Um, you have a fair amount of flexibility with these machines because you have a good amount of reach. Um, you're typically, your, your uh, cut to length processor is going to be more, have more lifting capacity than, than your forwarder. Um, it's still not quite as powerful as a feller buncher, but, um, Typically, the the wood you're processing with one of these is um, 
typically in, on the on the smaller side, then you you could potentially work with through a feller buncher, but you can still you know move around some good size material with these. Um, you're you have a little you have a, you have less control with with a dangle head processor than you do with like a fixed head machine. Um, a good operator can put a tree pretty much where they want it, but you know if a tree has a really heavy lean, like say it's leaning away from the water body, it's going to be a lot more effort to get it to where you want it than with some of the other systems. Okay, so slide number uh, thirteen, rather. So as I as I alluded to before, you know, the the planning of 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 your harvest in conjunction with drop chop and drop is really really important you know it's ideally you want to um have your chop and drop project uh go in conjunction with a with a um a, a timber harvest um you know with the timber harvest you already have that machinery on site you're not incurring the cost of just um lo you know relocating equipment to that chop and drop project just for that so um you know just from a financial standpoint it makes sense um you know the the person doing the work the logger is typically um you know not being paid for any of that wood that they're cutting so um typically there's some sort of negotiation um for that for their time and their services um and when when you have you know a timber harvest going on you have you know the flow of, of money that can offset the cost of them taking the extra time to do the chop and drop and then it's just it's always important to think of 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 things that we can't control such as weather um you know wood markets uh equipment breakdowns things like that um so you really you really want to um make sure that you're you're timing your um your project when when you have a relatively dry period of time or either that or or frozen winter conditions and then things like markets you know can make it make or break the harvest so um, making sure that you have outlets for the wood that you're harvesting um, is going to facilitate being able to have your chop and drop project uh, work out. But yeah, that's that's the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Great, thanks, Jim. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so moving forward, I think uh, we have uh, Chris uh, Reedy from the NRCS uh, to talk about um, some uh, funding availability uh, through some of his programs. OK, can everybody hear me OK? Yep, sound good. All right, we'll see if I can uh, have better luck than Jim with this presentation. Let's see. Everybody see my slide? Yeah, looks that's good. good. Yay. All right. Well, um, again, I'm Chris Reedy. I'm a fisheries biologist with the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service and wanted to thank um, Tom and company for inviting me to share a little bit about uh, NRCS and who we are and how we um, relate to chop and drop the uh, topic du jour. Um, before we dive into some specifics about how um, you know we're involved with the chop and drop, I thought you know there might be some folks out there that didn't know much about NRCS. Um, we are housed under the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and we've got a presence in just about every county uh, in every state in the in the nation. Here in Maine, we have 14 field offices. Uh, all around the state and uh, our field offices within each of them there's going to be somebody known as a district conservationist who is kind of like the jack of all trades uh, and, and can help um, you know uh, convey all things NRCS to folks that have questions about that so that's generally your first uh, place to stop and get information about NRCS and whether or not um, there's something that uh, we can help out with um, Another thing about NRCS is that participation in our programs is entirely voluntary. Um, we, you know, our mission is to to work with private landowners and essentially help them help the land. So we're not regulatory. Um, and um, the way 
uh, NRCS kind of roles is, is if a if a person has a resource concern on their their private lands, uh, this could be a person who owns that land, or it could be a person who can demonstrate control of that land. They would contact NRCS, indicate what their resource concern is, and we would work with them to come up with a conservation practice that helps address that resource concern. So. Um, pertinent to today's discussion, somebody might come in and have uh, concern that they don't have suitable aquatic habitat for fish and wildlife on their property. And we might go out there and say, hey, yeah, you're missing large wood. We can address that through our stream habitat improvement and management uh, conservation practice. Um, and then, you know, we also provide, you know, technical assistance and financial assistance um, through a couple of programs that we'll talk a little bit more about in detail here in just a minute. Um, so historically, you know, NRCS has been in the uh, aquatic habitat business for quite a while. And historically, our focus has mainly been directed um, at uh, connectivity and addressing barriers to aquatic organism passage. So taking a look at this graphic, you know, we've, you know, this is not just NRCS. We work uh, in close collaboration with a number of conservation partners and you know, collectively, you know, since 2011, um, you know, we've we've spent upwards of seven million dollars or close to seven million dollars to uh, reconnect almost 350 miles of stream, which is kind of a big deal. Um, however, um, we realized that, you know, connectivity is just kind of one part of the of the bigger picture um you know we need to ensure that once you know fish get from point a to point b they actually have suitable habitat uh, in which to conduct their you know their their life cycle needs and um you know taking a look at the stream here on the left uh, a few a few of the presenters i know john showed several examples of this um this is kind of a typical situation that we run into um, when we go out and, and take a look at, at streams. You know, this stream at the left, I think this is a stream from Franklin County. It's, I refer to it as a bowling alley. It's straightened, it has like very little habitat complexity um, and certainly wouldn't be representative of what a natural system should look like. So, you know, one of the first things we do when somebody, you know, is interested in improving habitat is, um, somebody will come out there, usually it's me, and we'll do an assessment and we'll try to quantify, you know, how much large wood exists out there um, in the landscape. And like I said, a lot of the ones um, that we look at look just like this picture here on the left, but we'll actually walk the entire um, proposed treatment area. We'll divide these streams up into different uh, reaches based upon gradient and riparian area vegetation and quantify how much large wood, how many pieces of large wood we find in each of those um, reaches. And um, as Tom pointed out, NRCS does have its own criteria for what counts as large wood and um as far as and also the target loading rate uh, of large wood and that that's dependent upon stream size and i'm not going to really get down into the weeds there but um i thought i would bring that up in, in tying back into the discussion about resource concerns that we had uh, a couple slides ago um you know if if after the assessment we determine that there's less than the target uh, large wood loading in that system, then we consider that a resource concern. Uh, it would be inadequate habitat for aquatic fish and wildlife, and that's something that would then be um, uh, something that's eligible to be treated through our stream habitat improvement and management conservation practice. Um, so once we go out and conduct the assessment, what I typically do is provide a trip report to the field office that summarizes the findings out there in the field. And then I'll also kind of try to uh, outline for them what the next steps are in the in the planning process. Um, and um, 
there the other thing I would bring up too, uh, we have two different scenarios for large wood addition currently. Um, the the manual scenario is what we generally refer to as chop and drop, and that's typically done with um, you know chainsaws and maybe winches to help move that wood around and, and bars to kind of help place that wood. Uh, and then we also have, you know, uh, an option for mechanical uh, large wood placement, which is a lot like what Jim was just talking about uh, towards the end of his presentation. And each of those have their own respective um, uh, cost share rate. So um, now let's let's talk about those two programs I mentioned that NRCS can use to um, help provide uh, the financial assistance for uh, large wood addition. Um, the first one we'll talk about is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. It's also commonly known as EQIP, and it's, uh, it's a voluntary financial assistance program where we'll provide uh, cost share and technical assistance to help folks address their resource concerns. And um, their eligible entities include um, you know, owners of of uh, tracts of land or also land managers that they can demonstrate control, as I mentioned previously. Um, this this program does have a couple of limitations that are worth um, talking about. Um, the first one is, is there is an adjusted gross income limitation of $900,000. So that's something that can sometimes uh, prevent us from working with some of the larger landowners. Um, and the second is, is there's also a farm bill payment cap, which basically says that no, no individual or entity can be paid more than $450,000 total out of a single farm bill. And these farm bills come around about once every five years or so. So, um, but, but that said, um, you know, historically, we've used um, this program primarily for uh, aquatic organism passage, uh, but new this year, um, we've also added stream habitat improvement and management as a core conservation practice. So essentially what that means is, is we can use, uh, we can do chop and drop as a standalone practice in our state uh, equip pool. So there are a couple of different, several different um, what we refer to as pools, fun pools under EQIP that can help address um, aquatic uh, habitat resource concerns as well as a number of other resource concerns. Uh, up until now, unless uh, an individual field office had identified, you know, uh, aquatic habitat improvement as a priority in their area, um, this, this practice wasn't necessarily available. Um, the other thing I'll point out is, um, as, as some of you may know who have worked with NRCS in the past, when we're doing forestry management practices, oftentimes before we implement those practices, a forest management plan needs to be in place. Um, aquatic organism passage has always been, uh, has received an exemption for the need for a forest management plan. And um, beginning this year, stream habitat improvement management is also an exempted practice. So there's no need for a forest management plan to be um, developed if these are the only two practices that um, you're, you're working on for a particular project. Um, the, the second program, um, that we use to implement large wood addition through NRCS is referred to as the Regional Conservation Partnership Program or RCPP. Uh, and through this program, NRCS works with conservation partners to kind of coordinate and leverage resources to implement projects within a defined focus area. So um, the the, the the major major deal here is major difference or one of the major differences between this and equip is that the conservation partners are often bringing a significant amount of financial assistance to, to the project as well and oftentimes that's usually about a one-to-one -one ratio so there's a there's a lot of dollars partners bring into this program 
Um, this program does have a couple of major flexibilities which allow us to work with some of those larger landowners that otherwise wouldn't be eligible for NRCS practices because of that adjusted gross income uh, limitation of $900,000. That does not exist in the RCPP program. And additionally, the RCPP funds um, that are, are used do not count towards the farm bill cap. So we've got quite a bit more leniency uh, with regard to how, you know, who's eligible for this program uh, and, and how much money can be spent on these projects. Currently, NRCS has uh, one RCPP with Trout Unlimited that is specifically for stream rest restoration activities. And um, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about those here in just a second. But I do want to take the time to point out that we are working and we're hoping to develop a statewide RCPP for stream restoration within a couple of years that's going to essentially open up the whole state. Uh, the whole state will be considered a priority area for for these types of activities of chop and drop and large wood addition and so on and so forth. So that'd be a real big deal right now. Um, right now, the areas uh, shaded here in purple are the only priority areas um, we're able to work uh, in for chop and drop through the RCPP program. And that includes portions of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. So it's kind of a multi-state uh, program. And, and again, the focus is on large wood addition. This year in Maine, we have uh, two projects that we're hoping to implement. Uh, one of them is up in kind of that northern uh, priority area, and the other is down east. And we'll be working on um, three um, probably second order streams. Uh, and um, adding large wood to about 3.2 miles of those streams. So real excited to, to get that work underway this summer. Um, and finally, uh, if you've got questions or you think that uh, you want to know more about how NRCS can help with chop and drop or anything else for that matter, again, your first point of contact might be the district conservationist in your local field office. Uh, if you go to, if you just Google Maine Natural Resources Conservation Service, you should easily be able to get to this uh, map here and find out who is your local contact. You can also contact me at any time and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about uh, what we, we may be able to do. Uh, I'll also mention that Ben Nelman, uh, he's my supervisor and also preceded me in this position. Um, he is the... Uh, He's the RCPP program manager and also the assistant state conservationist for partnerships and liaisons. And if you've got gr more grandiose ideas of how NRCS may be, may be able to implement uh, stuff like chop and drop around the state, you can give him a call. Um, and that's all I've got. So um, thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. Is there any, uh, any questions for Chris? Or anyone else for that matter? I'll just uh, I'll quickly mention uh, that the new um, Chapter 25 standards that we're hoping will go into effect next summer are very much in line with the NRCS um, standards that they have currently. Um, and as I mentioned, there is some leeway for projects that are, are using those NRCS um, standards. Excellent. Uh, but if there are no uh, additional questions, um, I will talk a bit about tomorrow. Most of us are signed up for that Lyman site uh, to have a look at Cook's Brook and, and how that's uh, developed over the years. Um, it, we are going forward despite the rain. Um, luckily, it's no longer calling for thunder showers, but it uh, looks like we will be getting wet. Uh, Mary, do you have uh, something to add? Yeah, if you don't mind, can I just share my screen again real quick? Because one of the things I forgot to mention in my presentation is at least within IFNW, we have identified areas of the state where uh, chop and drop and other potential habitat improvement actions um, uh, are area. We've identified areas where we would like to see more of this type of work happen. And I'll share my screen here. 
and show you what it looks like, as well as how to find the data set for anybody who is a GIS user. But um, if you can see my screen, you should see uh, the state of Maine with some purple identified areas. These are stream reaches that we are have designated as wild brook trout priority conservation areas. And if you are proposing work in any of those areas, IFNW will very likely be a willing partner to assist you in some way. And I do place a caveat on that and that we don't have financial assistance available to to help, but um, I and some other staff members are totally uh, potentially available to help with the technical side and planning assistance side of things. And you can find this data set at the main office of GIS in the data catalog um, at Megis, and it's this data set right here, Maine Wild Brook Trout Priority Conservation Areas, and you can access it in a variety of file formats. Thank you. That's great. That's great to have. I appreciate that. Um, so if there if there is nothing else, um, yeah, I'll just mention um, there is a small parking area in the, the Lyman site that um, we can gather at and chat a bit about the day. We'll have some light refreshments, hopefully just just some light rain and not not too bad in the morning, um, but please uh, come prepared for that. Um, and with that, I just want to thank all the other speakers uh, for uh, for helping out today. Really appreciate it. I uh, was glad to see um, projects moving forward and um, I'm excited to see what, what, what we can do in the future. So <laughs> thank you everyone and we'll uh, we'll see you tomorrow or or Wesley on the 16th. Great, thanks all. Thanks, thank Tom. you. Thank you guys.